You can either live on heaven on earth by viewing the world in a positive light, by being able to control your emotions. Doesn't mean you can't get angry. You can get angry, but just control it, stay leveled. Or you can live on hell on earth, which is this world sucks. It's against me. Everyone hates me. I'm not good at yeah, yeah. Nothing's working my way. All you're gonna, you're unable to see all the good options because you're so blockaded by that parasitic energy that's just pulling from you and pulling from you. And you guys, like, it was a picture of me just looking like a POW. Like, and I was just like, that, that's it. That's you at your lowest point. Don't go there again. Get back out. Hello and welcome to the Art Department Podcast, episode 48. It's Emmanuel Shu and myself, Jan Oschel. And today we have special guest, Dan Lovisi. And I'm going to throw it over to Emmanuel right away to introduce our new guest. Hey, so um, again, uh, Dan was my choice uh, this time. And, and I've listened to him talk you know, many times through the years. And I always have gotten a really good vibe from, you know, everything he's saying. And I find his journey extremely inspirational uh, and and real. I mean, I guess that's a, a, a word I could use because uh, whenever I heard you speak, it was just kind of from the heart. Uh, and I really dug that. Um, it was There's no fluff in it. So, and, and I have Last Man Standing. Uh, I love your art. And I just think it would be uh, super, in, you know, interesting to have you on. So... Um, I think for those of you who don't know, let's let's start with a little history on, you know, just you and then let's jump yeah. into sort of last man standing and, you know, what you've been doing and all that kind of stuff. For so, sure. Take it away. Yeah, no, so uh, artists been drawing all my life since I was a child. Um, my father was an artist. He started pretty young, but unfortunately, his father passed away. And after that, being the oldest brother, he had to kind of take over for the family and ended up taking banking, you know, as a career. Um, I'll never forget one of the days when he brought me into the kitchen and showed me this giant painting of this cave woman. And I was like, I want to do that one day. Like, that's amazing. You know, I'm not going to stay for Zeta like, but it reminded me of that. And I was like, that's something I want to do. And one of my first memories of drawing with him was drawing a Ninja Turtle character. And I was right next to him and he, he drew an even better one, you know? And I was just like, when you come back home today, I'm going to copy that as much as I can and try to impress you. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we'll see. And when he came back home that night, my mom had like the full drawing colored and everything done. And that's where, you know, he's like, what else can you do? And pretty much created a monster at that point. And it always mm. was trying to, you know, impress my dad, trying to show him that I could do this, that I could lead in a way where he didn't. You know, I wanted to continue that because I thought he had such a great talent. Uh, unfortunately, my teachers didn't want anything of it. You know, a lot of them looked down on me a lot of them thought I was a dumb kid you know like don't get me wrong I had ADD ADHD I was running around wasn't paying attention you know my mom used to show me videos where I couldn't even focus on what they're talking about they had to like hold my head straight sometimes but when it came to art I was zeroed in that was my main thing my getaway and holding on to that throughout school you know a lot of my teachers I didn't do well in school I got bad grades but again art was always that escape that allowed me to get by and I had a lot of people that told me, you know, you should push that away. You know, they used to tell my parents that this kid will be lucky if he ever flips burgers one day. And, you know, like, but then I had other friends that were like, no, what you have is a power. You're like a mutant. They're like, you know, normal people can only think about like one thing at once. You're thinking about different worlds, creatures, characters, all this stuff. And they're like, hold on to that. Don't let go of that. And I didn't. And throughout high school, <clears throat> Excuse me. I eventually taught myself how to do digital painting. You know, back then in the early 2000s, there really wasn't that many tutorials or workshops, especially not like there is now where it's everywhere. You know, so it was a lot of trial and error that took years to figure out. And it wasn't until I was about to graduate that my father got me a Wacom tablet. And <clears throat> that's where everything changed when I saw the potential of what I could really do with this. Again, <clears throat> sorry, I have a scratchy throat. All my teachers... You know, they, I got like D's and F's in high school in my art classes because they're like, he's not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Well, they're all doing like charcoal drawings and all that stuff. I'm drawing Neo from the Matrix. I'm drawing, you know, like all these wild characters. And they're like, they would take all everyone's art and put it up at the front of the school. And mine would be at the like way back. You know, you'd have to mm. go and find it somewhere. So, but again, it was that type of <clears throat> attitude against me that really inspired me to keep on pushing. You know, like I've always felt like that way that, you know, to quote Batman, why do we fall so we can learn to pick ourselves back up? And it was those moments that constantly got me back up. And I think it was 
my dad's kind of, you know, tough love on me that inspired that, that essentially made me look at every challenge as kind of a fun thing. So once I graduated high school, um, I had told my dad, I'm like, you know, he thought that I had to go to college. I had to go to a university that I had to do something big and that selling art was stuff you do at the Venice boardwalk on the beach. You know, like that's not a thing that you're going to make a lot of money on. And at the time I thought that he wasn't, you know, proud of me, that he wasn't supporting me, but I think it was just that bit of his past coming in and going like, you need to be safe. You need to really, you know, watch over all this and make sure that you don't crash and burn from your passion. But regardless, that just made me want it more. So once I got out of high school, I got my first job, you know, working on video game stuff and got fired about two weeks in <laughs> because I didn't understand deadlines. I didn't understand what they were doing. They were do they needed like big stuff and I was giving them corny little digital paintings. Again, I was like 20. So that didn't really work out. And after that, it was a lot of cheap jobs doing stuff for like, you know, Best Buy coupons, grocery store gift cards, not getting paid in cash, just trying to CD covers, stuff like that. And it wasn't until my mom called me one day and she said, I have this friend that's a director and he's got a producing friend that would love to meet you. He likes your art a lot and he thinks that there might be something there. And at the time I was like, mom, I don't want to meet any of your friends. You know, like I know what this is going to be, but she was like, no, really just meet him. So I ended up doing that. And at the time I didn't know who this guy could be. I was like, this guy could be anyone. I was still 20. I was a little nervous about the whole situation. I told him, I was like, meet me at Starbucks, some Republic. <laughs> so we ended up meeting there. And honestly, I was just telling my brother this. I was like, the first thing he did was he came in there and he's like, you look so skinny. Let me buy something to eat. <laughs> he bought me some food because I was so poor at that time. And he bought me some food and he told me, he was like, look, I hear that you're not really getting much work. You're not really doing stuff. He's like, I can't pay you thousands and thousands of dollars, but maybe what I can do is open doors for you. And I can maybe introduce you to those people. I can make you that money. And he was like, all I'm asking for you to do is just, we just work together. We just, you know, try to come up with these projects together, do a 50, 50 thing. And at the time I was like, you know, like I want to work for like Marvel. I want to do like this. I want to do that. So that really wasn't what I was looking for. But again, I had no money to my name. So it was either that or I go back to bagging groceries. So I told him, I was like, yeah, let's do this. Let's figure it out. And that night we stayed up till the morning talking about all of our dreams, all of the stuff that would one day happen that at that time, everyone was telling us, they're like, these are pipe dreams. This stuff's never going to happen. But I was like, look, you know, like I told him, I'm like, what I want to do is create a place where you can make your own IPs. You can make your own worlds and hopefully Hollywood can pay for them. And, you know, that's what we would do. And then we could hopefully help other artists do that same thing. So from there, we had this dream and it took a bit, you know, like we worked for several like freelance jobs. He got me my first movie job on uh, this movie called Aliens in the Attic doing concept art. And I was so, again, nervous at that time that I had him come in the meeting with me and it was really awkward. And, then you know, like I didn't know what I was doing. But over the time, he really started to guide me and mold me into more confident artists. And around that time, you know, like we're leading up to LMS. Um, we started working for Microsoft on this one job that they were doing Xbox short films. This is really early back in like maybe 2006, 2007. And they were working with James Gunn, who wasn't the James Gunn we all know now, Rob Zombie, uh, James, one of James Cameron's guy who we were working with and some other figures. And they're all doing these short films. And as I was doing tons and tons of work for this, once again, I wasn't getting paid. And this is about a year of doing work. And I was like, this is Microsoft. And I'm like, I'm not even getting paid for my work. And I told Stefan, I was like, how long is this going to happen? Like, you know, like I keep getting jobs that aren't paying me. Like, is this really how this industry is? And I was like, if I'm going to be putting all this time into this, like I need to make sure that I'm getting paid. The team that I was working with didn't really like that. You know, they were like, you should just be fortunate enough that you're working on Microsoft project, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this and that. And I was like, dude, okay. And, you know, I'm like, I need to pay my bills. Otherwise I got to go back home. And they're like, you know, how dare you? We can blacklist you for this. Like not Microsoft itself, but the team that was working with them was telling me this. And it was scaring the shit out of me. And I used to tell Stefan, I was like, is this it? Like, was is my dad right? Am I just going to do stuff on the boardwalk? Like, am I ever going to be that artist that I thought I was going to be? And it was in that moment, and sorry to be a little corny, but I looked up to the heavens and I was like, look, just like, give me something, please. A vision, an influence, something that, will not make me just be a cog that will not just make me do stuff and get treated like this because I can't live a life like this. I can't let my dad be right. 
You know, like I have to prove that we can do this, that we can make something of our name, that we can do something out of, you know, creation. And I promise you that next day I was going for a walk. And as I was going for a walk, I saw this character in my head that was that space galaxy head that everyone has stolen and taken and put in everywhere. And from there, I raced back to my office. I painted that up. And after that, I, you know, was really inspired by that and started creating a few other characters. And it wasn't until I created this one character, who I'll show you guys statue in a little bit, of uh, Gabriel, the main character of LMS, that everyone was like, I think there's something here on this website, DeviantArt, that I was posting them on. And that's where I called Stefan, and I was like, I think we have something here that could change everything, something that could be our platform. And that's another loaded story. <laughs> so I'll stop right there. But yeah, that's where that all came to be. And that's how, you know, essentially the first real chapter started before LMS took over completely. Right. Okay. So, and, and then, so from that point on, I mean, you know, I mean, I know you went through a lot of struggles with LMS yeah. itself and, you know, it was, it was a book, I mean, initially, right. I mean, yeah. T walk us through that. I mean, I... so with LMS, the first process of it was the book. Um, I originally had a few characters and a bit of a pitch of what I wanted to do. And I'll take the book out. What I originally wanted to do was I figured I'm like, it'd be really cool if we had this mercenary like character that broke into a police station and he stole the dossiers of all the targets that they're looking for. And from there, he went after them. It was set in some like zombie universe at the time. It was really cheesy and corny. But I had this idea and I told Stefan, I was like, it's just going to be like a 30 page book. It's going to be a small little thing. We'll make it out. I just want to make sure or that we can do one thing, that we can produce one book. And then from there, we can see what else we can do. Because I'm like, I think the people in DeviantArt really like this. And they keep saying, push something out. So from there, a 30 page book turned into this book, this giant, I don't know if it fits in the screen, that's about nearly 300 pages and the process of that you know like i tell people i don't remember it i wish i did i wish i had a better story there but i don't remember really making it it was such a blur all i remember doing was obsessing over it getting to the point where i had character notes and all written all over my hands going for walking like what's going on i lost my relationship with a girlfriend i lost relationship with some of my family with friends because i was so addicted to this and i don't know why because you know, like at the time, I didn't really know what it was. I didn't know what I was doing. All I know is that I wanted to create something that I felt was missing from Hollywood. You know, at that time, we were, there was no Marvel Universe yet. I think just like the first Iron Man movie was coming out. But there was really nothing different. It was a lot of the same old, same old. And I wanted mm. to bring back that fun from the 70s and the 80s of films that I grew up on. So from there, I just tried to push all that into that book. But as I began creating, it started morphing into something very personal. And once I began understanding who the character Gabriel was, that's where the whole book started coming to life. But it wasn't like a, I didn't have, I wasn't showing people all the time. I wasn't displaying it. Even on DeviantArt, all I was doing was teasing it. I would, I created like a fighting game website and every, I think like two or three weeks, I would put new characters on there with bios about them. And that's how I built up the hype. And it wasn't until I had about 40, 50 pages maybe that I told Stefan, we're going to need a publisher to do this. He was really close with Kevin Eastman, who is the creator of Heavy Metal and Teenage, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and um, who was like an idol of mine growing up. So he said, why don't we bring it to him? And I was like, that would be amazing. So that Comic-Con, um, you know, we talked to him about it. We told him that we would love to, you know, show you this pitch and show him what it's about. And he was like, I would love to. So that's where I got all ready. I created this pitch deck for what I wanted to do, and I got ready. From there, when he came over, um, I was super nervous. You know, like I pitched out what I thought this could be, what we could do with it. It still wasn't what that ended up turning to be. But I pitched him just the general idea of it. And at the time, I remember he was just looking at me kind of like I was crazy. And he was like, hey, I got to go put uh, money in my parking meter. And he like left the office. And I looked over at Stefan. I'm like, dude, he hates it. He's like, yeah, this is weird. He's like, I've never really seen him like this before. And he even brought beers and everything. And I'm like, yeah, it feels like off. So after that, he came back in. And he like sat there for a sec and he's like, you know what? I would be honored to do this with you. And I was like, holy shit. So from there, we had the book deal. I called my parents. My mom didn't pick up at the time, but my dad did. And like the first thing he said was like, that's great. So like, when are you going to get like a movie now? And I was like, God damn it. So that was like the next challenge <laughs> that I would have to build up towards. So from there, you know, like I finished the book. Now, again, I don't really remember too much of that. But the biggest point that will always stick with me, and I'll take this to my grave, 
was right when I was about to finish it up, like the last quarter of the book, and this was all Gabriel's section, the big closer, what we've all been building up to. And at that point, I sat there and I was like, I don't know how to do this. And it was the biggest moment of doubt where I, oh, I just part of remember I was sitting there. I turned around and I opened up the blinds and it was like 6 a.m. I'd stayed up all night. And when I went up into my room, I grabbed my cat and I went up into my room. And at this point, my girlfriend was sleeping in another bed because our relationship was just done. And I sat there on the bed and I was holding Gizmo and I was just looking up to the sky and I was just like, I don't think I can finish this. Like, you know, like just, I don't know what, I think it was just all the pressure, all the people going, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? And I think it finally just got to me. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I think this is going to be stupid. I think it's going to be too silly. It's too goofy. It's too colorful. No one's going to like this. And I was like, I'm going to be the only one that likes it. And from there, I didn't work on it for probably about like maybe half a month. And one of the walks, I went on a walk and I called two people. I called uh, my dad. And I told him about that and everything that I was doing. And he was like, well, look, if you don't finish this, there's going to be another artist that wants it more than you that will. And they're going to make it. And for the rest of your life, you're going to have to watch them enjoy that success. He's like, do you want to do that? I was like, no. And then the next person I called was Stefan. And I told Stefan, I was like, if I can't finish this for whatever reason or if it flops or if it doesn't work out, can you get me a job at like Marvel or ILM or whatever, or any of these places? Can you help me with that? He said, of course I will. And he's like, but I don't think it's going to fail. And he's like, if anything, what about this? He's like, what if one day you could call them to work on your project? And he's like, I think that's possible. And he's like, finish the book. And I was like, okay. So from there, I got back. I finished it up. I wrapped it up before the deadline. We sent it in. Everything was great. Like the way that we made the money was really cool. It's kind of like the first Kickstarter for like us is that I just hyped it up to the point where when we are ready, we gave them a date. We told them when we we're going to do it. And when that day came, we made $60,000 that first day. Heavy Metal even called Stefan. They're like, we've never seen pre-orders like this before. This is crazy. We're like, we're going. We're printing it. Let's go. The book came. We got the proofs and everything. And then finally, the final books came. Kevin brought them. We were so excited. I was like, here we go. I open up the box and I take out the book. And I'm like, no. And he's like, what? And I'm like, the covers are all pixelated. Every single cover was pixelated and blurry. All the back was inside. Several pages were messed up. And I was like, I can't put this out. And he was like, why not? And I was like, because it's ugly. And I was like, I refuse to. I'm like, I put too much work into this. These people have waited too long. All these people put their money into it. I'm not going to allow this. He wasn't happy about that. And I understand why. And he left the office. And I told Stefan, I'm like, I'm sorry, man. But I'm like, I hope you're with me. And he's like, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> and we're talking like 10,000 books. And at that point, I ended up going back. I remember like walking circles in my office, just being like, what are we going to do? You know, and I called a few people and like my grandpa, I think my dad and like another friend were all willing to help. And Stefan said, look, this is how we're going to go about it. Either they put this book out and we do that or we have to fund it. They can't fund another print. And I said, well, then we're going to fund it. So Stefan and I ended up racking up $60,000 and we paid for all the books again. And during this time, I remember we were getting emails from people being like, are you stealing my money? Like, where's my book? And I'm like, dude, I'm not stealing your money. I'm like, I'm making sure you get the book you deserve. And not the right one and not this dinky thing that like you should have seen the soft covers. The soft covers were like floppy wet books. And I was like, who's going to like this? Like, this is all awful. So from there, um, we ended up getting the books. Finally, we got them out at Comic-Con and we sold out all of them. And at that moment, that's where we got interest on the film deal. And that's the next part of the big story. Um, <laughs> after that, yeah, like if you want to say anything, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, I'm very no, entertained. No, no. I Please mean, go I'm, ahead. I'm entertained and I'm intrigued, man. Yeah, no. Keep going. So at that point, what happened is that when I showed Kevin the final book before the mishap, when I showed him like the final thing when I was done with it, he just looked at it and he was like, this is, this is not just like a movie or a book. He's like, this is a movie, a TV series, a theme park, candy, toys, clothing. He's like, this is everything. He was like, you have everything in here to do something from. He's like, you need to meet some people. So he introduced me to Russell Binder and Peter Levin, two uh, people that work more in the film industry on the entertainment side, like merchandise and all that, video games. And they came in, said the same thing. They looked at it and they're like, yeah, this is a lot more than just a book. We should go pitch this around Hollywood. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, uh, I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, you would have to go around to these studios and pitch it as like a film. And I was like, okay. I was not ready for this, so I had to like go to Express, get some cheap little suit, and then from there they set up the meetings, and that was probably the most nerve-wracking I've ever been. 
um, we sat with some big people back then, like the producers of The Dark Knight, uh, producers like Harry Potter, producers of now some of the Marvel movies that are out, some big guys. And I probably slaughtered each one of those pitch meetings, not knowing what I was doing, fumbling with the book. It, it, well, it takes place here, but wait, no, actually, wait, hold on. There's this character. Wait, shit. Hold on, sorry. Where's, hold on one sec. Like that. And they're just sitting there like suits. People that do not give a shit about anything I'm talking about right now that are just like, what's the story for the movie? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I just know the story for this book. And I'm like, I did not know. what. I, now I could pitch you eight seasons for a TV series. I was like with my eyes closed, with my hands behind my back. It's easy. But back then, it was still just a blur of chaos in my head that I wasn't able to fully explain into words. And I think I was just rambling and going off. And don't get me wrong. Like, you know, like a lot of the people were very kind and they were very cool. And they all love the book. They're like, this book's great, but it's like Mass Effect, right? I'm like, no. And they're like, like Halo? And I'm like, no. And they're like, what is it then? I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen it before. And I'm like, it's part Indiana Jones, part Blade Runner, part Star Wars, part Kill Bill. I'm like, it's everything we love. All the stuff in movies that makes something fun. I'm like, I want to make that. I want to make it where every moment you're just like, what am I watching? This is so fun. And, you know, at that time, there was no Gardens of the Galaxy. There was no Deadpool. There was none of the stuff that I could bounce off. There was no John Wick. There was none of the stuff that had style and color and flavor. It was very dull back then. So it was, I was just shooting from the hip, just trying to see what I could hit. And one of the meetings that I'll never forget <laughs> was DreamWorks. And when I went there, I met with this, I don't care. I don't even know if he's in the industry anymore. Some hotshot producer who had his like shirt opened up and everything. And he was sitting there like this. And I came in and he was like, so like, what is this thing? And I was like, this thing is my book. It's called LMS. And I pitched it to him. I'm like, it takes place in an alternate timeline, like an alternate reality. And he's like, what does that mean? And I was like, a reality that's similar to ours, but there's something slightly. He's like, I don't get what you're trying to say. And I was like, uh, uh, think like Matrix, Watchmen. <clears throat> and any of them, he looked at me. He looked at his other guy. And he's like, is this kid like, and I was like, dude, how do you not know what this means? And he's like, so it takes place in the future? And I was like, yeah, it, it takes place in the future. And he's like, ah, I still don't get what you're trying to say. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, fucking hey. So it was like trying to pitch these people that just do not get it. And he even said, he's like, look, I don't really know what you're trying to say to me, but he's like, you know, I definitely love the book, but I'm going to put schmuck insurance on this. I'm like, what does that mean? And he's like, it means that this is probably going to make a lot of money one day, but right now I don't see it. And he's like, until that day comes, still keep working on that fan base. And I was like, cool. So from there, I left that, you know, and at that, we had sunk like every meeting. Um, we eventually met up with uh, Summit, the guys behind Twilight. And they saw it and they're like, we love it. And I was like, uh, I'm like, is it going to be like some low budget, you know, like film that's kind of be played all by like 20 year olds and stuff? Because I'm like, it's not how I see it. They're like, no, no, no. Like, we want to make it like as close as we can to that book. So let's get a contract going. And from there, you know, we'll get the next step. So at that point, it was the next Comic Con. And um, we had waited uh, after Comic Con. They said we would get contracts going, but nothing had ever happened. We were still waiting like weeks later. At that point, I got a call from a guy named Roy Lee, who's a producer over at Warner Brothers. He brought, uh, I forgot what movie, yeah, um, Departed. He brought that over here from, you know, I think it was over in China first, Infernal Affairs, and then brought that over, How to Train Your Dragon, Lego Movie, et cetera. And he was like, you know, look, I really like this book, and I think it's cool, and I want to take it over to Warner Brothers. Is that possible? And I was like, well, I can't say yes, because I'm already, you know, in a deal with someone, but I also can't stop what you do for a living. So on you so from there he brought it over to warner brothers he said that he brought the book over to the head of warner brothers while he was getting the haircut he looked at the first few pages and was like yeah buy it so he came back to us and was like i want to offer you you know an option for this then paramount came in and they said we want to offer you an option and then summit's option was no longer a thing they and then it became a big war and from there i'll never forget that day sitting there at lunch just watching my phone go off like every five minutes and it was just everyone trying to figure out what's the best way. How are we going to do this? Who's going to get this and that? Um, I don't want to get too much into the details of this part just because I don't want to sour any names. But some shadiness happened and something was offered for me to end up leave my team behind. And I was like, why would I ever do that? And I went back to Paramount and I said, if you can match that, but give my boys producer titles, then we're in. And we hand shook in the room. And that was that. And from there, we got the option with Paramount. Um, that was probably the best day of my life. Um, it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the ego. 
it was just about the i can breathe now you know like we we did it we finally got through this point it's not impossible you know like we can actually get to these things that you can turn your dream into something more i never thought we'd get to the stage where we're at now and i'll get to that eventually um so in that point stefan i stefan and i were ecstatic you know all these companies started calling us saying we would have bought it we would have bought it and i was like no you guys wouldn't have <laughs> you would have shelved it if anything uh so as i was going on you know like we were all really excited about it and then from there um it was a lot of hurry up and wait you know like people saying that hey you know like we were like you know let's meet you with this writer let's get you with these directors let's get you with these people and then we would wait and wait and nothing would really happen they ended up getting a writer on it i don't want to taint his name you can look him up um he didn't really work with me at all he didn't really collaborate he called me once to ask me what the inside of a gas mask looked like and i was like what but like none of the story like when we got the script it didn't match anything about what was in the book or what we were trying to say and you know like that i understood that that's the process and that's how the game works but i would have hoped for a little more um once paramount saw that script they ended up not really liking it so they wanted a redraft of the script and then after that the second option came by and then it just kind of fell um I want to continue on real quick, but do you mind if I just look for my cat real quick? I want to make sure you can get outside. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> it's gotta take yeah, yeah, one yeah, sure. minute. To, yeah, my door's open. I just need to shake some treats and see if he comes over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, he's here. We're good. <laughs> yeah, no, I leave well, my sure, door open. You gotta now. You gotta now. show them your cat. You gotta show us well, your cat. Now. Hi. There's Gizmo. He Wait, goes outside? No. Well, yeah, he usually relaxes outside. And then here's my little guy. Oh. Here's Remy. Hey. Oh. <laughs> like, what am I looking at? Yeah, what All is right. this? <laughs> yeah. Do you guys mind if I, is this too loud if I turn on the fan? Oh, never mind. That's not no, it's fine. Should be fine. So, um, so, yeah, no, I'll get back to the story. Um, so, from there, what happened is uh, once. This is probably the weirdest part of Hollywood and the part that I did not expect is that once the option ran out, what happens is that the way that it works for the people that don't know is that Hollywood can either option or they can purchase your project. If they option it, they give you a certain amount of money that will last anywhere from six, 12 to 18 months. From there, they get a second chance to option it or they can purchase it. If they purchase it, they purchase it for a, big, a bigger number, you know, a larger purchase price. And then from there, they're essentially gonna make your uh, movie. So it's pretty hard to usually get to that purchase price, I've noticed, because there's so many cooks in the kitchen. There's so many things that have to be done before you even get to the stage where they're even contemplating that. So at that point, once the option runs out, you usually get your rights back. Not this time. And that was the scariest part of that I've ever been through. Um, you would think that your agent would want to help you get your rights back. But instead, I get dodge calls, doesn't respond to me. When I finally get to him, yeah, 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 I'm looking into it. I'm like looking into like it's one phone call. Like just call them and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no. I'll let you know next week. Next week comes nothing, nothing. I feel like a nagging girlfriend emailing and being like, dude, like where are my rights? Like I need my project. This is like my baby. This is my life. Like I'll jump off a bridge if I don't get this back. And he, yeah, no, 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 I'm working on it. And I'm like, that's what I mean by like the hurry up and wait. You know, and it's just that constantly. And I'm like, am I being toyed with? Like it felt weird to the point where no one knew how to get this back. As if no one had worked in Hollywood before. Thank God for guardian angel Stefan that came in and through whatever white magic he did, somehow got the rights back completely. And we didn't have to pay a dime for them. And after that, even our lawyer was like, yep, you got them back. <laughs> You're good. So when, when was there, this? This was this... probably about 2014. Oh, okay. That this part was happening. Yeah. End of 2013, 14. So once we got the rights back, it was a lot of, what do we do with this now? Like, how do we, where do we take it? What people do we show this to? How do we get it in the right hands? And thankfully more stuff was starting to come out that was a little more in tone with LMS. So it was a bit easier for people. Oh, it's like Deadpool when it's not at all, but still it's like, okay, yeah, sure. So it was a lot easier to take those meetings. But as we were pushing through that, eventually um, we started meeting with like, you know, directors, writers, people that we thought maybe would have more edge than just your, random executive producer that's going to have to then pitch it to his producer in a slaughtered <laughs> form than what I ever pitched. Um, and we met with one director, uh, Gavin O'Connor, who directed the movie Warrior. And uh, really cool, really good guy. And he saw it. And um, 
you saw the book and you saw what we were doing with it and everything. And I was actually hired by him to work on another project, but we ended up showing him LMS. And when he saw it, he was looking through it and he was like, this is great. He was like, this whole thing, you did this? And I was like, yeah. He's like, this would be like a great movie. And I was like, well, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> you know, like told him about <clears throat> what was going on with that deal and everything. And he asked me, he was like, who would you want to play uh, Gabriel? And I told him, I'm like, <clears throat> since day one, sorry, just dryer, cats. I told him, I was like, Bradley Cooper is who I've always wanted to play Gabriel. And I just think this would be, you know, a really cool, you know, face. I kind of based it off of him, you know, from like the A-team. And I was like, he just has that personality of who I see Gabriel as. And he was like, well, here, he takes out his cell phone. And he's like, well, now he knows. And he shows it to me. And I was like, what? It gets better. And <clears throat> he saw it and I was like, what the hell? And he then he's like, yeah, look. And he says, sounds awesome. Show it to me. I would love to hear about it. And I was like, that's cool. And then I was like, you can just do that. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was like, let me hear more about the project before we say anything to him and we'll figure out what's going to happen. And I was like, cool. So from there, um, I ended up working with him on it. And, you know, he asked me, he was like, tell me what this is really all about. I was like, oh, let me tell you. So at this point, I had more of an understanding of the story. And I can tell you guys because I don't mind it. Um, so essentially, LMS, you know, the book, the kill book is a revenge story. Gabriel, the super soldier that was created to win this alien war on Mars, ends up coming back to America and is anointed the protector of tomorrow. And from there, his job is just to clean up crime, to make sure that this place gets turned into a better one. Unfortunately, he is framed by an extremist group known as Pandemonium, and for his crimes, he's sentenced to the inescapable prison level nine. After nine years later, Gabriel somehow breaks out and he enters into a new world that's been taken over by conglomerates, corporations, government, uh, secret societies, extremist group, gang members, etc. And from here, he now has to save the people that you know helped uh, fig or create him in the first place. So, what that whole book was was just a single arc of like what LMS is now. It's so much bigger now. This is no, that's not the story. That's maybe five percent of what the story is now, for what I have in my head. So now the new, not even the new story, but what I want to do now is I'm like, for us to really understand who Gabriel was. I want to start him off at his childhood and I want to see the inception of him. Why was he created? And, you know, like who ended up inspiring him? You know, like we've seen the big bad at so many times, but what created that? And I ended up, you know, basing it a little bit off of my childhood. And, you know, for every person that told me you're not good enough, you can't do this, you can't do that. There was, you know, more people that told me you could. And I wanted to create a character. So Gabriel has an operator known as Emma. And she's the mother figure that, you know, she's the daughter of Gabriel's original maker. And she gets brought in at this really crucial time to come work with them because they tell them, look, nothing's working with this super soldier. He's a young boy and there's something inside of his genetic DNA that's unallowing him to grow up to the size of the adult that we need him. No matter who we put on him, nothing else is working. And we believe that it has nothing to do with the super soldier serum or whatever, but that he doesn't have anything to fight for. He has nothing, there's, you know, he doesn't listen to military figures, just go exterminate, exterminate. He wants to be a hero. So she inspires that and she teaches them those human qualities, which are will, gut, drive, everything that we have inside of us that allows us to achieve the impossible. And that's how you become invincible. So I have this big theme, this big thing. And he was like, yeah, let's pass that over here. Let's come up with it from ground zero. And I was like, what? And I was like, you know, like, I can't do that. I'm like, that's like taking Harry Potter and then making him like a football star. And I was like, you know, like, like there is something here. I'm not saying that it has to be 100% this or else fuck you. I'm not working with you. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, please use this as at least the nervous system of the body. You know, like, it doesn't have to be the bones. But at least use this as, like, an influence for what I'm trying to tell here. And, you know, like, so I went in there. I had to, like, ninja in ideas. I would be like, what if, like, Gabriel did this? Like, acting like I just came up with it. And he would be like, that's that right there. That's great. Put that on the board. I'd be like, oh, God. So I'm like, it was like discombobulated ideas telling this weird story that was like five different arcs in one. And I was just like, this sucks. But I was like, whatever. So we went over and we pitched it a few places and we pitched it to Universal. And the guy that was listening to it, he was just like, I was watching him try to pay attention. And he was just like, what? And when it was done, he was like, look, you know, like, I, I like the book. He was like, I like the book a lot, which is what everyone said. But then they don't know what it is. And he was like, but why is my wife going to like this? Why is my daughter going to like this? And I was like, can I take over? And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. 
So I showed them a picture of Emma holding Gabriel as a child, and he's got all these cables inside of him, and he's asleep on her shoulder. It's the weakest picture of Gabriel I've ever painted, especially compared to the guy that you know. And I showed it to him, and I was like, so as a child, and I told him that story, you know, you'll flip burgers one day, kid. And this is what I became. And if it wasn't for those people, then I wouldn't be here pitching. Gavin wouldn't be here directing, and you wouldn't be here leading Universal. And your wife looks at your children the same way that Emma looks at Gabriel, and I think that's why they're going to care. And he's like, well, why wasn't that in the fucking pitch? And I was like, so then we left there and Gavin was like, great job. Let's go write that up. And I was like, cool. I literally just sent him what I had before. It was everything I said. I didn't write a word. I sent it back to him. Calls me up. Look, I, I just don't get this. I don't get what you're trying to say here. And I'm like, it's a sci-fi Rocky. That's all it is. I'm like, it's a sci-fi Rocky. It's about how Gabriel wins the war and became the hero we all know. It's the first five pages of the kill book. And he was just like, look, so we can go about this two ways. We can go about this that you write your version and we send it over to Universal and we see what they say. Or we do my version. And if we do my version and they like it, then I'm leaving this. And I was like, uh, I already know what's going to happen. They're going to look at me and be like, who is this kid? Yeah, we're doing your version. And that's that. And then I have to walk into a theater three, four years from now and watch a movie that isn't mine. You know, like that isn't something that I wanted to ever see made. And I'm like, I just can't do that. I'm sorry. And I'm like, no disrespect. Like, you know, like, thank you for having me here, but <clears throat> I can't do that. And I'm like, it would go against everything that the story stands for. And he, he congratulated me. And he was like, you know what? He's like, good for you. He's like, many people would say, yes, where do I sign? What do I have to do? And he was like, please hold on to this. And I'll be the first in line to see it when it comes out. And I was like, thank you. So we moved on. From there, we tried a few more places. I've had multiple people laugh in my face. I've had multiple people tell me what LMS is and tell me who Gabriel is. And I'm just like, that's not what it is at all. And I've gone through a lot of this stuff. I've had people where it's so weird because when I tell friends, when I tell people that don't even know where someone will be like, Dan, tell them the LMS story. And I'll tell it to them, they'll look at me. And I'm, I'm really not trying to gloat here. I'm just trying to say that I think I have something that people can relate with. And they'll show me goosebumps. And they'll be like, like what you're saying is what I went through as a child. They're like, how do they not get that? And then I tell Hollywood, and the moment I get it, like to the emotional arc, I'm like, and then Emma, does, they're just like, yeah. when does like Gabriel get to that point though? And I'm like, he's going to. I'm like, that's the big reveal. That's the big moment. That's where we all cheer is where he finally turns into that. And then he fucks shit up and wins the war and saves the day. I'm like, that's the big hero moment. And they're like, yeah, but like, <sighs> they show me the book like I've never seen it before. But like that guy, like when do we see that next season? <laughs> like, you know, like it keeps going just like other properties do. And they just look at me like I'm bad shit insane. Like I don't know what I'm talking about. Like I've never read the hero's journey. Like I've never studied any of these things. Like I haven't been working on this for 12 years. And it was just that over and over and over just gaslighting and just like going like, and I'm like, why am I doing this? So eventually what I did is I put together um, 150 paintings, not all finished, not like what I usually do, but like rough, you know, colored and paintings. And I just drew out the story for Gabriel and Emma, what they were going to do. And from there, I was just like, you know, screw it. I'm just going to edit this together. I'm just make a simple little trailer. As you know, <laughs> the simple little trailer <laughs> turns into yeah. 30 minutes of stop motion animation, <laughs> sound effects, music. I hired actors and everything. And uh, I ended up creating this little thing that, you know, ended up turning into a seven minute short. And at that point, Stefan doing his weird esoteric Hollywood producing uh, ended up getting some connections through people. And I don't know if I'm really allowed to talk about this, but they said that we could and we could go around and it would just make the story so cool. And I haven't told anyone this yet. So whatever. Um, so what ended up happening is that I'll start with names so I don't spoil the big reveal because it's why I believe that something more exists to this world than just us living a job from eight to five and that's it. I believe that we all have this ability to tap into something more and hopefully if this all comes together, I can be living proof of that. So what ended up happening is that Stefan was selling props through this one company in Germany and there were Marvel statues, really cool Marvel statues of like all the characters and everything. And they would go in theaters, millionaires, houses and stuff, Marvel Studios, whatever. And one of the ones that he did was Rocket Raccoon. And he's like, I want to give this over to Bradley Cooper as a gift, you know, and just send it over to them. And he ended up doing that. He gifted it to them. They loved it. They thought it was great. 
And uh, Bradley's producer hit up Stefan is like, so what do you guys do? Do you guys just like make statues? He's like, actually, no, that's not what we do. He's like, that's just something I do on the side, just to whatever. He's like, we actually make properties and we make stuff. And he's like, awesome, let me come by sometime. I was like, for sure. So he tells me, I lose my shit. Um, you know, like I end up signing a, a copy of LMS for Bradley Cooper. I try not to simp out too much. And then I put it down and then uh, his producing partner comes by and he's like, tell me what this is. So I give him the story that I just told you guys about Emma and Gabriel. And he's like, that's great. He's like, I love that. You know, like it's very emotional, has a great hook. But he's like, the issue is, is Bradley's just so busy on A Star is Born right now. It's going to be impossible to get his attention. And I was like, it's all good. You know, just the fact that you're here, the fact that I can give you a book to give to him. Like that's, if I were to show you guys a post in Facebook in 2011, like I said, this would happen one day. I posted a picture of Bradley as Gabriel. I said, movie gods make this happen. I'll be patient. And I was like, so just the fact that I'm here, it's cool enough. And he's like, awesome. So he goes his own way. We don't hear anything else. We continue on. We continue pushing. We meet a few people, like the company Digic, we sat down with, CG company that's done stuff for like Love, Death, Robots. Really cool, very cool. They want to like partner up with us. Let's create like an animated LMS series. And I was like, fuck yeah. So we talk about that, but you know, just life happens. Uh, stuff comes up. And then in 2000, I want to say 17, maybe 18, I end up uh, meeting these two brothers, the Jagger brothers. Dean Jagger is in the show Warrior on HBO Max. He was also in Game of Thrones. And then uh, Ben Jagger is a writer director. So they end up coming down once again, just to work with me on some stuff, just to like do some project work with me. But Stefan's like, so have you guys heard about LMS? <laughs> he shows it to them and they see it and they're like, what the fuck is this? They're like two big British guys. And they're looking through it and they're like, you did this. And I was like, yeah, they're like, what is this? And I'm like, I don't know. And they're looking through, I'm like, can I show you guys the trailer? I'm like, I think you guys will like it. And they're like, yeah. So I show them the trailer and as they're watching it, this is where I knew they were the right guys. I watched both of them like clench their fist in excitement at like the part I wanted them to. At like the big moment where Gabriel reveals who he is and turns into a badass. The, everything I've been trying to tell Hollywood. And they both like clench their fist and they're like, yeah, yeah, fuck our project. Let's do this. How do we get on board with you with this? And I'm like, I just need help getting them out there. That's all. You know, I'm like, I know the story. I can pitch it to you guys. I'm open to work on it and develop it more. Let's figure it out. And they did. You know, we all shook hands there. We ended up getting a contract signed between all of us. And for the next two, almost three years now, we would work on it. But as we were working on it, Ben, Dean was filming elsewhere. He was filming Warrior. So while he was filming that, I was working with uh, Ben, just walking him through, making him understand the rules. Probably the most patient anyone has ever been with me in terms of like creative on LMS. And he would sit there and just try to understand it because there was so much. I'm talking like eight arcs that take us from a simple baby super soldier to the final days of mankind, the book of revelations, the final war. And like how everything and how we get to this and all of the rules that have to apply for us to get there. And he worked on it with me. We wrote stuff together every day, you know, getting together at this like restaurant and just jamming out. We really became like family there. And like I consider him family. I take a bullet for the guy. And after that point, as we're working, they told me something that would lead to the magical side about what's to happen. So they told me, they're like, hey, are you into like synchronicity or any of that stuff? And I was like, not really. I'm like, I don't really know too much about it. And I'm like, you know, like I know about like the occult and all that stuff. I'm really into that type of stuff, but not really synchronicity. And they're like, well, Dean was born on 11-11. And they're like, we see it everywhere. And we look at it as like a good hint. They're like as a, you know, a good little thing. You know, keep following whatever it's leading to. I was like, cool. Well, if I see it, I'll let you guys know. So like as we we're doing that, you know, I started seeing it more often. And it wasn't, you know, like at first it's just like on you pick up your phone, 11-11. You're just like, oh, cool. But then it got to the point where I'd be sitting there and I'd be like, fuck. And I would like pick out a book randomly and like open up the page and be like, oh, that's what I needed. And then as I'm looking, I'm like, oh, page 111. I'm like, OK, whatever, you know, just probably just by chance. But then it got to the point where it was like every time, every time I'm thinking about something, there's 1111. It's there. It started seeing it so much where I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, it's just because I'm overthinking it because they told me about it. But it was I even told them, I'm like, no one would believe us unless they were there in those moments to see that it felt like we're almost being guided by something. So one day I go and sit down with them and they're like, look, we've been wanting to tell you this, but we wanted to get to know you first before we told you. And I was like, what are you guys part of some like secret society or something? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> they're like, no, uh, no. They're like, before we ended up moving here, we were construction workers. They're like, we weren't actors. We weren't writers. We always dreamed about being them, but we come from middle of nowhere, England. 
And he was like, we had to hit concrete with hammers to make money. And he was like, we had this dream though, that one day we're going to make it no matter what. And he's like, before we left for America, we ended up meeting this psychic. And he's like, our friend told us to meet him. And then our mom told us, you know, you also got to meet him. And, but we weren't really like into that stuff too much, but we we're like, fuck it, fine, whatever. So we entertained the idea. And Dean's like, I go in first. And she says, I know what's going to happen. One day you're going to be sitting there and you're going to be covered in rain. And when that rain hits you, you're going to realize that you finally made it to where you needed to be. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's like, it rains all the time in England. So how am I supposed to fucking know? But he's like, but then this. And he shows me a video of him on the set of Warrior. And it's just him. And he's sitting there on a wagon. And all this rain is just right on top of him. Like on the machine. And it's nowhere else. And he was like, it was right there where it hit me. Where I finally felt comfortable in my body. That I finally felt like comfortable in this state. And then he's like, Ben, tell him what they told you. And he's like, you told me two things. And he's like, the last one's the craziest. But the first one was, they said that, make sure you pay attention to a butterfly. And he was like, he was like, I was like, what? He's like, what is that supposed to mean? And then he takes out a video and he was like, on the last day of work, look, and he shows it to me. And he's fucking sitting there with like a hammer on his shoulder and everything. There's just a butterfly fucking perched on his shoulder. And he's like trying to move it off and it's just hanging there on him. And he's like, it stood on me for like an hour. And he was like, this was like two weeks after we had met this person. And I was like, what the fuck? And then he's like, yeah. And he's like, but the weirdest was the final thing they say. And I was like, what? And he's like, I promise you, we're not lying to you. They're like, they told us that we would meet someone that had black hair and glasses. I used to have glasses. And they said, that would change our lives. And then we meet you. And we had this moment, and we have never felt this way creatively with anyone before, that we have someone that gets us, but that we also get you and what you're fighting for. And that it's more than just making a movie. That's about getting the message out, about helping people. And that's why we're here. And that's why we felt we met you. And then I was like, no, let's fucking do it. Let's get this done. Let's finally make this. So about a month later, Dean goes back. Ben and I are on our way to original films to pitch LMS, producers behind Fast and the Furious. And as we're in the car, I'm like, let's go get a coffee real quick. He's like, sure. So we get in coffee. I order. I sit down. I sit down. I look at Ben. I turn to my left. Bradley Cooper's right here next to me. And I'm like, dude. And I look at Ben. He's like, don't say anything. I'm like, I'm not going to. And I'm just looking at him. I'm like, you can't say this is a fucking coincidence. And then he's like, I know. He's like, just enjoy it. It's going to happen. And I was like, I know. So I didn't say a thing. Didn't say a word. Didn't bug him. Nothing. Just kept, went on my day. We left. Went to our meeting. About a week or so passes. And Bradley Cooper's uh, production company called Stefan. Wants to talk to him. Wants to see what you guys are up to. It's been a bit. We haven't heard from you guys in a bit. What's going on? Funny you called. Dan just saw Bradley Cooper at a restaurant. Holy shit, why didn't he say hi? He's not going to do that. And then he was like, well, you should have. You should have said something. Hey, let's set up a meeting. Let's get you guys down here. Okay. So we set up the meeting. We get this pitch together. Ben and I take our Uber. We get out of the Uber. Ben walks. He looks around. He stops at the address and he goes, no, no, no. And then I what? Look. I look at the address. It's 1111. And I was like, what the fuck? And I ended up looking it up, and it says 1111 typically means that you have met your destination and you have arrived at where you should be. And essentially, we're with Bradley Cooper's production company right now on LMS with talks of him possibly being Gabriel. And that's everything that we had wanted to get to from like the day that I had said that and to finally be there and to be in that room, to be in his actual office, to be looking at it. I was like, anyone can do this. You know, like I'm a silly kid that could barely get through school. If I can do this, then why can anyone else? Why are we being told that, that we're not good enough, that we can't do this or that? Why are so many people not trying to reach, not just working for someone, but having everything? And ever since that moment, things have changed for me where I just, you know, like I think it's one of the reasons why I haven't painted, why I haven't really been too vocal online, why I haven't really talked about anything is because I've been going through a bit of a change and I've been beginning to understand a bit more about myself and that I feel like, you know, like a lot of people have told me that you have to take a moment to smell the roses. They're like, you know, like when I say like, why isn't it getting made? Why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? Why can't I get this out there? Like, bro, like, you know, here, look, they're like, you have a statue of your character. You know, like you have toys, you have people in other countries drawing your cat, you know, like as a character in your book. They're like, you know, like you have all these fans, people dressing up as Gabriel, like you did it. You set the influence, you set the seed, you know, like you don't have to do anything else. You know, like you should just be proud in that moment of what you've created. And it's been a lot of that of soul searching. And, you know, 
what it really, you know, in terms of like, you know, like I said, when you first asked, like, you know, where have you been? And I said, oh, that's a loaded question. In terms of like the creative bit, I think it's more just taking a moment to breathe, trying to download. But then in 2017, 18, it was a, a slew of things that hit me at once that really brought me into a state of depression that I think really curveballed me. And um, we had, my stepmom had lost her friend in the Vegas shooting and uh, the one, the massacre that happened at the hotel during the country show. And my sister also lives in Vegas. She was working there that night in that city. And my friend also was out there that night. That, the amount of gun violence that was going on over the weeks. I had a business opportunity that I don't want to name names on this because this one's big, but something very big was building up to allow me to do something and essentially was pulled right out from under my feet and it was done in almost a malicious way and that really kind of just threw me out and then about two months after that my business partner or not my business partner no sorry he would never do anything uh someone that i brought in on a project um got him like a big role in it everything completely tried to throw me under the bus uh, i was told by my lawyer you know only after it after they ghosted me for months on end and they didn't get away with it because none of it was true what they tried but all of those things happening at once just brought me to a point where I was like, I'm just not happy. And I think it was some stuff from my childhood that I was still carrying that I hadn't figured out yet. Some insecurities about, am I a good artist? Am I still that guy anymore? And I think as the years built from 2017 to 18 to 19 to 20, then the pandemic hitting, I think it was just so many things on top of it that I just fell into a really dark goal of depression. And uh, I have no shame talking about that. Um, I was losing weight uh losing hair um i wasn't thinking about anything creative all i was thinking about is how disgusting this world is how mad at it i was how mad at it i was at people and power that were lying to our faces and yet we're told to believe them there was just so many things that were just angering me about everything and the thing is is a lot of people not a lot of people but some people are hitting me up being like where is this coming from like who is this side of you i've never seen this before and I was like, have you guys not read my book? I'm like, I'm not a fan of the government. I'm not a fan of how things are and how people are treated. And, you know, like a lot of that book, I think now looking back was projection. I just was subconsciously projecting it. And now I, you know, being able to put that book to how I was feeling lately, you know, I think it was a big learning curve where I was like, if I ever step foot back out into the art scene or into the film scene that I do this for a better reason than just getting a paycheck, just getting a cool home one day just being able to get a fancy car. I don't care about any of that material shit anymore. All I want to do is hopefully show people that you can achieve this and that you don't have to work under someone's thumb, that you don't have to continue to build someone else's dream and that you can become literally whatever you want. You just, it's will gut and drive and that's all it takes. And it was really, that's why I'm saying, I'm like, that's why I think it's so important that I can get this to a point where it's actually real and we have all the people so I can show all the steps and I can say like, it's real. Every time you see people on Shark Tank or any of those shows saying, all you have to do is just hold on. That's all it is. Literally, that's the truth. That's all it is. There's nothing else to it. And, you know, a lot of, you know, like I started getting into research, like into our ancient past and trying to find influence and role models that aren't here anymore because I can't find any today that I look up to, you know, and trying to look back and just being like, we used to aspire to greatness. You know, our ancestors wanted to be something huge. And, you know, the fact that we just feel like we're kind of declining, that really began to influence something inside of me back in like 2018, but I didn't know why. And I tell people, I'm like, in order to figure out what my next book is going to be, which will be called Where Gods Die, um, which is going to be the fantasy origin story of how LMS came to be. So like their ancient history, I had to, I had to fall. I had to go to my darkest point. And when I started to look into like philosophy of a lot of like Carl Jung and Nietzsche and a lot of these people, they all said the same thing that essentially you have to destroy yourself and that only in that darkness can you find that light. And if you can be able to be strong enough to pull that back out and I guess channel that into your work, that's where the greatness came from. And right there, a light bulb went off and I was like, all of my projects have been spun out of anger. They've been spun out of fear. They've been spun out of danger, out of me thinking I'm not going to be able to do this or I can't do that they influenced me to get my ass in the gear. So I think the last three years has been a lot of that, just building up and building up and trying to get to a point where I felt comfortable enough to really be able to start something new. And that's what my next book is going to be. And that's where I'm at right now. So, so are you I back to painting I'm, and yes. Yeah. I just painted two pieces recently. I did a, 
a nod to Berserk and the late author, Kentaro Miyara, that just passed. And I'm working on, uh, yeah, like I said, just putting together my next book, which will be my take on the Lucifer Rebellion, the fall of man, Adam and Eve's fall. I think there's something there that I see that I've never seen done before that I want to try to approach that I think could be really cool. And those that I've pitched it to are all like, yes, please do that. So I think I have something. And so I'm going to start that, but I'm going to take my time and really try to get back into it because not that I'm like rusty or anything. That's what I was worried about. I'm like, if, if I start painting and I suck again, then like kids that are like 16 and 17 that are making short films, that look like something what it did. So I'm like, it has to be good. So, you know, like I feel like I still have it. So it's just about trying to get back on my creative ground now. And I just moved recently and I just got out of a relationship, a breakup for three years. So being, you know, back on my own now and being back in Santa Monica where I can take walks near the beach and just get fresh air, it's really helping out and really getting me out of that dark state that I was in. So I feel good. That's awesome. And, like and, and LMS is in progress still. Yeah. Just... So right now with LMS, yeah, there's, there's, there's interest from some of the biggest studios out there, but it's the same thing. We love it. It's great. But we're looking into it. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> so I'm just waiting on that. And then I recently, I don't want to name him yet, but a very big director producer, excuse me, just recently came across the book and sat down with me. And um, I spoke to him about it. And he was like, you know, hey, he was like, look, I love this. I love the Kill Book. He's like, I have so many ideas. Can I pitch them to you? And I just said, can I pitch you real quick what this is? And then can you tell me if that's still it. And then he was like, yeah, for sure. So I pitched him that same thing and he was like, no, that's it. He's like, that's that emotional arc. He's like, if you can take that and push it into a bigger story, let me know. And I was like, I can do that. So he thinks that he can set this up as hopefully an animated series, like, you know, something like Love, Death, Robots. And he said, and I respect his because he's definitely got the, you know, the resume to back it up. But he said, he's like, what you need to do is first, you need to get your audience. And he's like, maybe that's in the short films. Maybe that's into something smaller. But he's like, I think if you jump into this as a movie first, it's going to be too big. You know, like they're going to try to make it small and they're going to try to dumb it down. And he's like, with anything, we need to build up the precedent. So when we do do the movie, you can point to that and say it needs to be this. And it can't be anything less than that. So I trust him. So we've been talking with that. But honestly, like, I feel it in my heart. You know, I was talking to my brother about that. And when people say, hey, like, is illness ever going to happen? I don't have a moment of doubt. Like, you're going to have to kill me. Like, I'm going to have to die. Like, that's the only way it won't. And then Stefan will probably get it made. You know, but like, it's going to get made. It's going to happen. I can see it. You know, like, I can listen to music and I immediately see the trailers in my head. And I'm like, it's that clear. It's not like a, I kind of, I see their lips moving. I see the words coming out. I can see them voicing the trailer for me. Like, that's how clear it is. So I have to believe that that's pulling in from somewhere. And like my, like Dean said, who gave me great advice, he's like, look at it like this. You're watching a movie, a great movie. Just enjoy it. It'll happen. It'll come. And it'll come when you least expect it. And I think that's what's going to happen. And if everything, what I think is happening right now is coming to be, it's going to be a really great story when we can finally tell like how this finally came to be and all we had to go through to get here and how many people told us. And watching all these copycats rip off Gabriel too has been heartbreaking. But I'm just waiting for that day where we can finally show people what this is and hopefully deliver something that, the first Star Wars did, the Lord of the Rings did, because that's my goal. And that's where we're at. Is, is that short anywhere out there to be seen, or was that just a private I can, I'll, I'll definitely send it to you guys, but I don't want to show it yet just because it gives away a lot of what I don't want to fully tell yet. But uh, Okay, 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 okay. I'll send it to you guys for sure, yeah. No, I was just wondering because, that's, I mean, I'm curious. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Wow. It's, it's essentially, it's just a, it's a big nod to underdogs. It's a big nod to anyone that's been told you're not good enough. Art, any artist, anyone that's been through that fight, you know, I think they would be able to instantly attach with Emma and Gabriel. And that's why I've been trying to tell people, I'm like, we have something really special here that has nothing to do with guns. Has not, that's all there. That will all be there. Trust me. That's why I keep telling people, like, don't get lost in the action. And I'm like, what we're trying, like the reason why people spread memes of all these characters from Marvel, all these like pictures and all this stuff all over Tumblr is because they love them. They feel invested. They understand them. They're related to them to their own psyche. And I was like, in order to do that, you have to build a foundation here. You can't just pop guns off and expect them to, you know, fully love it. So it's just been an uphill battle. But I think that the more some of these projects come out, the easier it is for me to back up my argument. So I switched a little quicker. 
<laughs> yeah, wow. Well, I wish it was in a but, I mean, I mean, uh, we, we haven't had a chance to ask any questions just because, I mean, I've been kind of <laughs> mesmerized by the story. Jan, did yeah. you have anything oh, you wanted to Oh, I have ask? tons of questions. I have tons of questions. I'll, I'll yeah, please yeah, yeah, go yeah, for, for sure. it. Open book. <laughs> I mean, um, <clears throat> What to start with? I mean, uh, on a, on a pure on a pure maybe business side of things, like uh, there's I mean, from from the time that you first pitched this idea to the studios and and to now, I mean, it it, it seems at least from an outsider's perspective. I mean, okay, we're like a little bit outsider. We're, we're we're outsider to the pitching game of of getting your own IP made, but we're still working within the industry, right? But so. It feels like a lot has changed, and and I'm wondering if, if for people who want to uh, sell their own IPs and get their own projects made, um, with like whatever you want to call it, the streaming wars and seemingly like all the big studios or like big Silicon Valley companies with unlimited pockets, trying to get the next big thing made, um, do you feel personally in your journey that? there's a lot more interest right now in in lms than it was before or yeah i i heard a great quote that said if your product can last more than 10 years then it can last another 10 years and thankfully we've been able to keep the book alive and i don't i'm, I'm not going to toot my own horn on that but it's we're just blessed to be in that state so thankfully we still have people that are like yeah i i look at this book all the time because a lot of people in hollywood when they were given it they now have it on like their tables and stuff. Mm. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, who knows? <laughs> but you know, we have had you know a bit more interest lately because I think yeah, like you said, with like the streaming stuff, with all these different ways, you know, you can go about it. I think they now go like, okay, it doesn't just have to be a movie. Maybe we can do like I said, the Love Death Robot shorts, mm. or we can tell a different character perspective. Mm. We don't just have to do one. So yeah, you know, like it's been there, but still at the same time it's still such an uphill battle you know like i had one meeting i mean this isn't gonna give me trouble i had a meeting with netflix and you know i pitched to them probably one of the best pitches i've ever done and when i was done with it they're like this this is fantastic we love it this is great this is awesome okay you know like let's go oh yeah let's think about this let's look at the kill book and we'll get back to you i'm still waiting so you know like that, that's the thing is that like there's definitely interest and these people get stoked but a lot of these guys have, and I mean this with all due respect, because I understand, but ADD. And there's so many projects coming in at once that, you know, they're probably going to go with one, the one that's going to influence, you know, whatever Hollywood's trying to do the most. And then two, whatever is going to rack in the most money, you know, because right now LMS is still unproven, even though the book did well. And, you know, if it has a fan base, it's still not the next big thing. So we still have to build that up. And I think it's just, like I said, when I say that, I feel it, that it's going to happen. I think we just have to find those right players that can all come together at the right time. Mm -hmm. And if it's meant to be, I believe that it'll happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I still have so many more questions. I'm thinking oh, about, yeah, thinking right. about, um, there's something interesting you said about um, how, how to say that, um, a lot of the a lot of the producers recommended you to build a fan base first like have have mm -hmm. proven success in different formats before you can do this as a movie in the appropriate scale but then that makes me think about like like so what about other sci science fiction movies that work on a pretty big scale and that had no audience that came seemingly out of nowhere like like let's say for example like um i don't know for some reason stuff like Oblivion or or what's the other Tom Cruise like Edge of Tomorrow they kind of come to mind uh -huh. I mean of yeah the Edge of Tomorrow was based on a Japanese novel but I don't think that was like a worldwide blockbuster or anything like so yeah. how how does some I mean okay it's Tom Cruise okay like given he, he's, <laughs> well, he's yeah, a force oh, of man, nature just... but how does something <laughs> like that come out of the blue and and why why oh. do you think you're being told that like okay, like, oh, like, I need to see this succeed somehow first before I'm going to give you a lot of money. Like, is it, is it, are we talking about completely different scales of, of movie making here? Or like, am I comparing yeah. apples to oranges? Or I think it's, it's a, a handful of things. I, I, I forgot who published Edge of Tomorrow. I think it was originally called All You Need Is Kill. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. want to say Dark, I want to say Dark Horse published it, the American version. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, 
then they may have a already existing option deal with the studio. Uh, okay. So then the studio can then go and look at their library and be like, we want that. Can you adapt that into something? And then they'll take that. Mm -hmm. So that's like one of those reasons. Now, Oblivion, I think that was more of like a, I don't want to say a crapshoot out of disrespect because it was a beautiful movie, but it didn't do that well financially compared to you know some of his other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that was because more people didn't really understand it. So you will have moments where these type of movies can get made and get put out there, but they have to have some caveat as in Tom Cruise is attached mm. to it and he's producing mm, okay. or this guy. Now that's why I always wondered. I'm like, if we had Cooper doing it, wouldn't that be enough of a mm. maneuver? But I guess not even, wow. you know? So like, I, I don't know. Like, that's the thing is I wish I had some cheap book that told me all the secrets of Hollywood. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's a great question. But, the thing is, is that, yeah, it's, it's so random because, I mean, look at Avatar, right? Mm. You know, like Avatar didn't have anything, but Cameron's behind mm. it. You know, like when, for example, you know, like Gardens of the Galaxy, when that was first coming out, I remember a lot of people were like, that's not going to work. Because no one knows what that mm, is. No mm, one, mm. I was like, it doesn't fucking matter. Mm. It's beautiful looking. Yeah. It's cool looking. It's different. It's weird. Mm. It's funny. That's it. That's what people mm. want. They just want something new. And that's why I kept on like wondering with LMS. I was like, I don't understand what's so hard for them. I'm like, I look at it this way, very maybe autistic, but to the point saying, look, all you have to do is put a good story that's mm -hmm. relatable, put a great art team on there that you mm -hmm. know understands it, get a director that knows how to tell a good story and get a competent writer. And we should make money. You know, like we're not trying to make something that's so out there and weird where it's like, what are they trying to mm -hmm. say? You know, like, I don't really feel like our story is that, you know, like again, esoteric or hard to understand, but I don't know. And, you know, like the issue is that I tell people, I'm like, I don't even get a chance to get in there to pitch that part. Hmm. You know, like they usually stop it before that because they believe that they know what I'm trying to tell them. I mean, it, so, I mean, you know, like, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting you said, right? Like uh, uh, since since this project has been going around, it has been it, it's it's been more than 10 years since you've been um, um working on this right i mean like what 15 years now mm -hmm. um, or whatever it, it's, uh i started in 2007 yeah so like 14 so, right? yeah. 14 years i mean um is it is it difficult like you said like um not only directly is it probably being ripped off right but it's also it, it like mm -hmm. it, the 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 character of it f finds its way into into other properties right and and i mean maybe maybe like yeah there was a lull definitely in the in the maybe probably like mid mid 90s to mid 2000s and in, in the kind of like r-rated blockbuster was nowhere to be found right but now now it's getting yeah. now it's getting out there again with like huge. like yeah deadpool and all this kind of stuff like right um, um but at the same time i don't know like it feels also that what you can say and what you can get away with and, and it's it's getting it's getting more and more limited on a daily basis and and mm -hmm. the landscape is changing in terms of what you can say what you can't say um and like up is down left is right yeah 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 and it's like um i don't know is it, is it difficult to i mean I, it must be incredibly difficult to keep something like this continuously on well, top of your mind and, and like and deal with it and I don't know potential legal issues that you have to fight against and adapt it to the prevailing mood of of viewers and governments I mean I have no yeah. idea this sounds like I have never well, I've honestly never stuck with anything that long um, and it, I can't even imagine yeah. what you're going th what you had to be going through and to see like he, and still be like here's the thing with it. <laughs> here's the thing is that you would think that, but if you look at the book, essentially it explains what we're living, living in right now. I mean, the first page is an agent telling Gabriel, the mainstream media has completely been taken over. Your audience are being fed lies on a daily basis. You live in a state of fear, chaos, and panic. The government is controlling everything, and they're essentially about to go into putting that final step in, where this is it. If we don't come in now, it's game over. You look at how the pandemic is treated. You look at how the government is treated. You look at military being pushed into Washington. You look at all of these riots, everything going on, the censorship as well. I mean, like I even make fun of that in the book. There's so many things in there in the book where a lot of people are like, wait. And I'm like, that's why I want to get it out. Because, yeah, you know, like I feel like not only would it be relevant, but it would kind of be a 
a bit of an ass kiss to this weirdness that's been happening. Like, I'm, I'm not really too crazy with the whole censorship thing. I think free speech is very important. I think as long as you're not hurting people, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, or you're not inciting violence, of course. But, you know, like what's been going on feels like there's a bit of a bias. I'm just going to say that. And that, you know, like I feel like that if we keep going down that route, we're not too far away from what, 1984 is the book? You know, like where everything starts getting a little too funky. And, you know, like that's what this was all about was about stopping that system from ever infecting freedom. And, you know, like so that has been a thing when it comes to the lawsuits and the ripoffs. I can't say much, but I will say this. I've been told before where people are like, oh, what, does Dan just think that everyone steals his stuff? I'm like, no, it's not that at all. It's when I'm literally told by people that worked at the studio that they're looking through your book and they're stealing stuff and they have your pictures all over the walls. Hey, you should do something about this. That's when I'm saying it. When I'm told by multiple artists that when I'm told by people in China, when they're coming from their studios and telling me that, yes, I'm going to do something. And I feel like I have the right to do that. And I have won lawsuits before. I cannot speak about them, but uh, they were great. And I'm glad that we did it because we set a standard for that. And I've had even people in the industry say, we can't do this anymore. We can't like fuck around. Like everything needs to get approved before anything goes out. And I'm like, good. You guys shouldn't be going around. Like I was told once before that some guy from, can't say the studio, but a very big studio and a very big game. He was like, yeah, I saw him copying your blank character. And I told him, I was like, you can't do that. That's Dan's work. He looked at him and said, I don't care. It's not mine. And then walked off. And I'm like, that's how they treat it. And I'm like, meanwhile, I'm fucking suffering, working every day trying to get this thing, trying to hold on to that originality. So it bums me out, but I was told a great quote. Um, uh, John Rosengrant over at a Legacy FX. I went over to a studio once when they built that Gabriel statue right up there. And uh, when I went over there, you know, he, he took me into a room. Real quick, a tangent. In Comic-Con one of the years, we were selling the Kill book, and the director of Underworld, Len Wiseman, bought the book. And I remember watching him buy it. He directed the new Total Recall. And as he was buying it, my girlfriend at the time told him, hey, he can sign the book for you. And he literally looked right at me, and I was like, I'm good, and took the book and walked off. I didn't take anything because I'm like, I don't know the guy. But I just thought that was weird. And I was like, okay, whatever. (laughs) Moved on. So I go over to the new Legacy, and I go to the studio, and they're like, come over here. And they show me a room and there's a door and they're like, before we take you in here, we just want to tell you that we fought as hard as we could to not do what he wanted. But and I was like, what? And then they opened up the room. There was Gabriel's everywhere. And they're like, Glenn Wiseman came in with your book and was showing us all through and everything and saying, make it like this. And we're like, we know the guy. We're making a statue for him. We can't do that. And he's like, well, try to do as much as you can. Now, Legacy did nothing wrong. So I am completely not outing them. But in that moment, John told me, he was like, look, I know this sucks, but he's like, what you need to see is that they can take your art, but they can never take this. And he's like, the moment they take that, then you're in trouble. But he's like, you can always be more creative. You can always be more imaginative, but it's up to you to hold on to that. So that's been one of the things that I've been trying to do is keep the dignity of LMS alive. I understand that there will be designs that will be influenced or subconsciously influenced. I don't mind. I see it all the time. I just saw one last night that had a glowing triangle in the center of the helmet, everything. But shit happens. Now, but when I'm, like I said, back to what I was first going on, when someone tells me that they're doing it and it seems somewhat weird and like, you know, agenda-driven, that's when I have to speak up and I'm glad we did. So yeah, times have changed, but thankfully they haven't affected us as most might think they would. You know, like maybe me mentally, but (laughs) other than that, yeah, no, we're still kicking. Cool. Emmanuel, do you have any questions? I still have. No, I, still I mean, have. I'm just... I still have. Go for it, Jan. <laughs> oh, yeah, go. I mean, actually, um, maybe to 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 get a bit of a glimpse on, I mean, you've you've been keeping this project alive for a long time. Um, I, I I'm I'm wondering, like, what does it really take in terms of? I mean, you you've hinted at it here and there, but what does it really take in terms of the economic uh, and the overall overall personal sacrifice to keep this running? I mean, there must have been projects oh. you need to take for clients to make yeah. money, to make ends meet. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't th- like, I don't want people to get the, the idea here that, oh, you, I used, you made the book and then you sold the book and the book pays for everything all the time, right? No, um, yeah, no, or like any like kind of option, right? So, I mean, there still needs to be like, okay, you, you need to do a certain amount of client work and you need to do this and that to keep yourself going right i mean that that's on top of everything you do so no you're completely right um 
So I'll be honest. Uh, I probably haven't gone about it the best way. I'm very stubborn. Um, I can't really work on stuff that I'm not too into. And I don't mean that in like a, I'm too cool. I mean mm. like a, if, yeah, I mean like if I can't emotionally connect with whatever I'm working on, you're going to get shit work and I don't want to give you shit work. I would rather just not do it and have some better artists take over. So that's happened a lot. Um, but I've also been very blessed in regards, like every time I get down to that bottom line of going like, dude, this is getting scary. You know, like I'm not making anything, nothing's coming in. We're not selling anything. And I'm only saying no to jobs because I think that something's coming, but then nothing ever does. Always at that final hour, even my cousin said it, like back in February, things weren't looking too good. I'd break up, move out, everything colliding at once. I, the pandemic was still weird, masks, everything. And I was like, everything was going wrong. But my cousin told me, he's like, bro, you know that at that final hour, you're going to get saved. Something's going to come through. And lo and behold, it did. And I, that's why I always feel like there's, there's something here. Something's thankfully watching, but you know, like I've never really gotten to the point where it's been so dire where, you know, I had to go back with my parents or I couldn't, you know, I had to go sleep on a friend's couch. I've always had either a friend that could help me out, family member that was willing to help out or a job that came through, or I was able to somehow scrap something together. Also, Dogecoin really helped out. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> Great. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. Yeah, that, that came in big time. I, I was one of the investors that put in money like a year ago or so. Wow. And uh, oh. yeah, just, yeah, it ended up coming through at some really important times this past year Interesting. and helped me out. So yeah, so that, that's that. But other than that, I don't try to take on too much work. I just worked on Black Panther 2 oh, nice. and wow. Venom and Carnage. Those were probably the biggest things that I did. Great. And then other than that, yeah, right now I'm doing creative consulting work for Squanch Games, the people behind Rick and Morty. So yeah. I'm working with them and that's, cool. that's probably one of the coolest jobs I've done. Cause they're just like, just go wild, be funny, do whatever you want, mm. have fun. And I'm like, see, that's when I can feel like I can actually be myself. Interesting. That's MVP. great. That's yeah. great. And I mean, the, the last question is kind of disconnected from, from my side. Um, I mean, it, it, it kind of comes through here and there, but I mean, what, what role does like spirituality and religion play in, in, oh, in, <laughs> in, in LMS and in your personal life? I mean, it seems like you had some, uh -huh. Uh, experiences here and there but to to what degree i mean on, i honestly have to say i haven't read the book so maybe if i read the book it's i, I would, would be good. all in there but i'll send you guys a digital copy so you can awesome, check it out awesome i mean so well i have the book so okay yeah. i mean oh, but cool. I, I was yeah, wondering yeah. um what what role does it play for yourself personally and and in in the stories you make um, no i'm thank you for asking i've been waiting for this question this is what i wanted to talk it's the about highlight of the show. <laughs> yeah Time for weirdo Danny to come out. Um, <laughs> honestly, uh, yeah, this here. How do I okay, so real quick, I'll just give you the brief version uh, and then I'll tell you how I really feel about all because it's so important to me. It's crucial. Um, as a kid, I'm a Christian, baptized Christian, um, went to church school, but I'll be honest, none of it ever made sense to me. I wasn't able to relate with the church that much, but there was something that did pull me to God. There was something that did make me believe that there was something here that I don't think it's what they're telling me it is. And I didn't, I had no disrespect to anyone that does, you know, like I'm still a Christian, that's fine. But I feel like that in order to figure that out, I would have to find that out on my own. Um, I've talked to my cousin a bunch about it and I've always been like, every time I prayed, as corny as it sounds, something happens every time, you know, like something good comes. So I'm like, whatever that is, if that's energy, if that's just my brain thinking that way, I'm like, that's what kept me safe when I was a little bit younger. But then as I started to get older, especially recently, especially recently, um, in 2017, I got really into it. And I think that was the fall. You know, like when I fell really far and went into depression, I had to find my way out. And money wasn't going to do it. You know, party wasn't going to do it. Girls wasn't going to do it. I feel like I had to find something spiritual, something inside. I had to find God again, but in my own way, some in a way that a pope couldn't tell me or whatever. And I started doing a lot of research into alchemy, into occult, into spirituality, into the times of antiquity, um, into the black magic, white magic that they're doing, people like uh, John uh, Deere, or, you know, like uh, all these people that were really into like trying to conjure archangels, trying to see, because I'm like, why did they all believe into it so much? And then when I saw what Epstein was up to, when I saw what Hollywood is into, when I saw all of their symbolism and all the stuff, I was like, okay, there's something definitely here. You know, like there's something that's influencing this. And I'm like, 
if people believe in Satanism and Luciferianism, then there has to be another backbone to all these other religions, that there has to be something greater here. And I found this one website called, uh, I'm going to slaughter it, and you probably won't be able to find it if I say it like this, but it was called Bibliocyclopedia. It was some weird, like, GeoCities looking website that I found one eerie night. And if you click on archives, it gives you everything, everything that you would want to learn about all of this stuff. And I'm not lying when I say this. Probably about a week later, I had about 900 Word documents of just all different subjects about all different topics. You know, a lot of it, like copy and pasted, but with my notes inside of it. And what I was trying to find is essentially what is going on in terms of like energy. You know, like why all the propaganda? Why all these rituals? Why all these occult practices? Why are there secret societies? What do the Freemasons do? What do these people do? What is all of this stuff about? Why is there so much satanic symbolism in Hollywood? You know, and then you see what Epstein and his clowns were up to over on the island and all of this stuff. And I was like, there's something going on that they're not telling us. And then I started going through all these moments, all these synchronicities and all this stuff. And I just started to see, like, is there a way that I can pin this together? Not so I can, like, reveal the truth. I'm not trying to be, like, a disclosure guy or anything, but more for myself. And how do I take whatever I'm learning and push it through my work? It's preachy. You know, like when I say that, that next book, Where God's Die, is going to be about Adam and Eve, don't think you're going to see what you've seen before. It's not going to be anything like that. I'm just taking those very loose concepts and all that esoteric, occult, weird stuff that you see in anime, and you're like, how do they think of this stuff? And then you realize, yeah, I now know where they get it all. When I used to think that they're all so clever, I'm like, how are they coming up with all these names? Bahamut? What is that? And then I looked at it, I was like, oh, it all comes from our past. <laughs> mm. When I started seeing all that, I guess I just found more stuff that told me it's real than stuff that told me it isn't. And, you know, like I started just listening to a lot more podcasts from very bright minds, from philosophers, and just with my own way of thinking, trying to stitch it together. And I kind of feel like I started seeing something there. So in terms of like, you know, religion and spirituality, how it plays for me, I... I wouldn't say I'm agnostic. I, you know, like I, I believe in God. I believe that there was somewhat of a Christ figure. I don't know if that was his original name, but I believe that there was something there. I believe in other religions as well. I believe that, you know, the fact that we could have all of these ancient uh, temples that have all the same symbology, all of them, yet there was no way of communicating back and forth back then. Like, I feel like there, there was something there that we don't know. And it's just something that I've always been interested in, especially lately. So, you know, like it's, I have so like if I were to show you guys my books, I have so many weirdo books and people would be like, what the hell? <laughs> but it's stuff to me that like I can read like one page of like this alchemy book that I have and have countless ideas you know, of all this stuff. So it's just it's really interesting. But like, you know, like some people like I've had people message me being like, dude, like, what are you trying to do? Like, you know, like, have you like lost your mind? I'm like, I'm a fucking artist. <laughs> I have fun with this stuff, you know, like I like obviously I, I was telling my brother, I'm like, unfortunately, I have bills to pay. So I have to remain somewhat grounded. I have cats to feed, so I can't go fully off the boat, you know, and I'm like, I have like and then there's LMS. And, you know, like we've had family members that have like suffered from some mental stuff before. So I've always kind of watched it. But in terms of like, I just feel like there's such an interesting side of the world that's not really talked about that much. And whenever it's brought up, people get very emotional about it because there's so many conflicting views and i try to look at it as like who knows like seriously who knows when people try to tell me like you don't know if that exists i'm like you do like my 35 years on here are not enough compared to the thousands and thousands of what researchers have done and so yeah i, I believe that there's some type of energy here that connects us all i believe that we all have the potential to be something far more than what we've been told and i believe that we all have a bit of a spark inside of us that if you know how to activate and ignite it you become somewhat invincible. I don't mean physically, but I mean spiritually, that you can achieve the impossible. And I try to push that everywhere I can because I've lived it, I've experienced it. And, you know, like, I get to wake up to it every day. So, and, you know, I've told people, I'm like, the reason why I get so harsh on the subject sometimes and try to push that you should do your own thing is because there will never be, like, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm sure there will be, but that experience that I felt when I saw Legacy reveal that Gabriel statue to me, I have never felt something like that before. Like my heart sunk. And when they told me like, we would rather make this than another Iron Man, I was like, what? <laughs> like just hearing that, I was like, I want every artist to experience that. I want them to all have that special moment because I feel like we all came here to create. 
and that, you know, we all have this potential to share these amazing ideas. Like so many people have told me before, I don't know, man, I don't really like have that, that imagination. I'm like, who are you kidding? Yes, you do. You see the world differently than everyone else does. We all have our own perception. And if we could learn how to finally control that and channel that energy into something creative, hell, I think this world would be a lot more cooler to live in. And it wouldn't be so cutthroat like it is now. And I feel like so many people are distracted by just bullshit and nonsense and, you know, hate each other for what you look like or how you're different or this or that. And I'm like, this is not why we came here. So that's one of the reasons why I got into it, because I feel like I wasn't being fed what was good for me. And I needed something that brought me back to the light. As corny as that may sound. No, well, I don't. I don't think it that, sounds corny. That's at quite. All. Pro I don't think that yeah. sounds corny at all. I think that's actually quite profound. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and then, know you know that's some people can get like weird with it, and they're like you know like they they try, like I've seen people try to think like if you talk about it, you're being like so like high and mighty. I'm like it's not that at all. It's just that I was getting to such a dark place that I would look at pictures of myself and be like, you're disgusting. Like you look like a bug. You know, like you like you're not taking care of yourself. You've lost it all and. They won if that's how you're going to be and you can't go down like that. And, you know, like when I started getting back to that and I found, you know, God again. And to me, God is energy. It's just this. It's whatever that feeling in your stomach that says, go paint, go create. Oh, that's influencing. Go write that down. Oh, go do that. That's God to me. You know, it's keeping me alive. It's keeping me focused. It's keeping me grounded. It's not making me lose it and hate the world. <laughs> so, that's, yeah, that's no, I mean, I, I. Important. Yeah, I'm with you because I've I've been through some of those times myself, and and you know that that's the kind of stuff that bring uh, you know, I mean I I'm not much of an organized religion guy. Um, it's just not yeah. who I am. Neither am I. Uh, yeah. But I'm I'm more about spirituality, and and I think that's important. And you know I'm also trying to create some of my own um, stories and IP and stuff like that. And and I think the best way because I'm I'm writing all that into it uh, yeah. because I think it's important because if if it has the, the chance, you know, to be seen by many, hopefully some kind of positive energy, spirituality, that's the kind of stuff yes. I want more in this world. So mm -hmm. that, that really speaks to me. Um, so that's no, awesome. You're, uh, you're completely correct. And that's why I tell people, I'm like, you can really go, you have to look at it metaphorically, not literally. You can either live on heaven on earth by viewing the world in a positive light, by being able to control your emotions. Doesn't mean you can't get angry. You can get angry but just control it, stay leveled. Or you can live on hell on earth, which is this world sucks. It's against me. Everyone hates me. I'm not good at yeah, that. Yeah. Nothing's working my way. All you're gonna, you're unable to see all the good options because you're so blockaded by that parasitic energy that's just pulling from you and pulling from you. And you guys, like it was a picture of me just looking like a POW. Like, and I was just like, that, that's it. That's you at your lowest point. Don't go there again, get back out. So that's why mm -hmm. I got into spirituality lifting and just trying to get mind and body back together and it's helped oh, so that's... much well i mean you know you sound like you're in a much better place now and i'm glad to hear that thank and you. i can't wait yes, to, to to see what's next because i mean i've been curious and you've been you know quiet now we know uh thank and you. i'm you know really glad um <laughs> did you have anything more yeah no i'm i'm good i think it's it's a great it's a great uh, uh point to to kind of wrap this up um just want to say a big thank you to Dan for for sharing so much of his journey, and I hope it's it serves as a big inspiration for for everybody listening. And um, of course, to our audience, um, please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this interview. And um, I hope you have a good week. See ya.